everyone. Um, welcome everybody to uh, the special seminar. Off to a good start. With <laughs> the special seminar for the study of Western um, Centre for the Study of Western Tradition. And I would like to give a, a special welcome um, to those who have not attended a seminar um, for the centre yet. Especially, although there's, I mean, I, there's some faces here I don't recognise and understand. Um, uh, a Woodbury descendant is here tonight. Is that right? Con Woodbury. <laughs> okay, so, uh, as well as members of the Wood family, I imagine. Um, now, the, the centre is the, the, the collective research branch of Campion College. It brings together under one umbrella the research interests of the faculty at Campion and encourages further scholarship uh, at, um, and scholarly activity at the college. Um, and, and it's my pleasure to be directing the Centre through its early years as we host several events linked to the um, study of Western tradition. Uh, since its formation and launch in 2010, uh, we've held several seminars led by prominent um, Australian academics relating to the history and philosophy of um, liberal education, the development of European scientific thought, um, as well as uh, studies um, based on uh, Christianity in Australia. Uh, we've also organised workshops and conferences on the purpose of a liberal education in Australia. Uh, that was in 2010. The, the post-secular age um, a conference we held last year. And uh, earlier this year, uh, natural law and revelation in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, and we're now also supporting the series of seminars and symposia staged by Dr. Matthew Tarn, who's the Campion Lecturer in Philosophy and Theology, uh, under the banner of uh, Seminars in Political and Religious Life. Uh, so far, one session on that's been held in, in Melbourne, um, sort of a travelling uh, show, if you like, uh, the next one uh, to be held uh, later this year, um, right here. Uh, furthermore, uh, just to, to continue giving you an overview of, of some of the Centre's activities, uh, we hold a reading group with Campion's philosophy students who will host a public um, workshop in October uh, on their interpretation um, of Plato's dialogues. Um, finally, we look forward very much towards the International Coll Colloquium uh, beginning on Friday this week. Uh, on the Christian view of history and the revival of the liberal arts, organised by the college president, David Daintree. Um, and it's not too late to register um, forms that are just outside. Now, if you'd like to know more about upcoming events, and, uh, you can pick up some brochures, look at our website, or, or leave your contact details with us on the registration form outside. Uh, now, normally our seminars are held on Thursday nights. Uh, tonight's seminar, however, is, is very special and it's tied to the college's life and activities, uh, particularly um, later tonight, formal hall and uh, the student public speaking competition. The reason for this is that tonight's seminar is led by our first research fellow, Dr. Christine Wood. Now, the fellowship was designed to encourage research associated with the specialised collection um, of Campion College Library. Um, the St. Edmund Campion Collection, containing materials related to the history of Catholicism at the British Isles from the 16th to the 19th centuries. And the Austin Woodbury Collection, um, which uh, Dr. Wood has been examining over the recent weeks. Uh, so Dr. Wood was awarded the fellowship to explore the Woodbury collection consisting of several uncatalogued uh, notes, lecture materials and unpublished manuscripts um, by Reverend Dr. Austin Woodbury as, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Woodbury's, as well as containing Dr. Woodbury's collection of Thomistic um, theology and philosophy works. Now, I'll leave it up to, to Dr. Wood to explain the content and relevance of the collection and, and Woodbury's works, um, with which she's been working very hard over the past few weeks, um, with, I should add, the great assistance of our librarian, um, Sangela Um 
Dr. Wood comes to us from John Paul the Great Catholic University in San Diego in California, where she is professor of theology and specializes in systematic theology. She's, uh, she tells me she's also the director of the New, um, new Evangelization uh, and uh, one of three professors uh, who um, have been setting up a web series called Pillars of Catholicism. Have I got all that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a free series for anyone uh, wanting to know more about the Catholic faith. The title of the PhD is The Metaphysics and intelli Intellective Psychology in the Natural Desire for Seeing God, Henri de Lubac, <coughs> Neo-Scholasticism. Uh, and this was received by Mar from Marquette University in 2011. So we're delighted to have had um, uh, uh, Christine in our company for the last few weeks, and we're delighted to have her here tonight, and I'm looking forward to hearing about her findings in the library. Please welcome Dr. Christine Wood. Well, thank you very much, and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to hear me talk about Dr. Woodbury and my findings in the Woodbury collection. First of all, I would like to thank Campion College for granting me the Austin Woodbury Collection Fellowship. It has been a great privilege to be one of the first people to actually open the boxes and scour through all of the material and do some research into the actual writings of Dr. Woodbury. Um, I would especially like to thank Luciano Boschiero for the um, for granting me the fellowship and for making me comfortable in my stay here with um, accommodation, office and everything. Um, it's been really wonderful, so thank you. Also, I would like to thank Angela Kohler. She has been extraordinarily helpful in this project. Um, your unremitting enthusiasm for the project has really encouraged me to really dive deeply into the works. Um, and it's been wonderful to have you as a guiding light. So thank you, Angela. I have to say um, that Angela's work um, in collecting, in acquiring the Woodbury Project is really a huge work. It's, um, it's contributed to the history of Australian culture and also to the history of the Australian church. Um, without the work that Angela has done, that collection of Austin Woodbury, all of his, his life's works could have disappeared. That's how um, precarious the situation was. So once you understand the depth of his thoughts and his writings, you'll come to see how valuable Angela's work has been. So it's a real credit to your efforts, Angela, so thank you. Um, I actually studied at the Centre for Thomistic Studies for 10 years um, and the centre was founded and run by some of Dr Woodbury's students. So you can see why I love Dr Woodbury's works and um, hold him in high esteem and see that this collection is so important for Western culture. I would also like to thank my family for their help in the research, particularly my brother Andrew, who's not here at the moment, but he has been so helpful in his, the, the vast knowledge he has of Dr. Woodbury's um, writings, the history of Dr. Woodbury, his life, um, the character that he had, everything um, with regard to the personality of the doc. Um, I would also like to thank my father who came along here for a, uh, a number of days to help me out in some of, some of the quite menial tasks in going through and, and um, categorising some of the works in the collection. And finally, I'd like to thank my mother. You have been very helpful and supportive in my work, so thank you. Now, let's get on to Dr. Woodbury. Austin Woodbury was a man ahead of his time. He possessed a great mind for philosophy and theology, in addition to a tremendous foresight for the future of the church, particularly the laity in Australia. In response to Paul VI 
and John Paul II's call for the new evangelization. Christians are to be leaven in society, to proclaim Jesus Christ and his gospel, not just in word, but also in deed. Moreover, Christians are called to be aware of the culture in which they live in order to shed the light of the gospel in dark places, to scarify society of malicious seeds, and above all, to bring people to encounter our Saviour Jesus Christ. This indeed was the vision of Austin Woodbury, but how did he do it? My lecture tonight hopefully will shed a lot of light on the way Austin Woodbury brought this about. Austin Maloney Woodbury was Australia's best known to mystic, philosopher and theologian. Born on the 2nd of March 1899 in the small town of Spencer on the Hawkesbury River in New South Wales, Austin was the sixth child of 11 children, born to Austin Herbert Woodbury and his wife Margaret Maloney Woodbury. He decided to join religious life and after investigating various religious orders, two orders in particular stood out, the Dominicans and the Marists. Not knowing which to join, he decided that he would join the order of the next religious priest to come to Spencer. In 1916, a Marist priest by the name of Father Jeremy Taylor of the New Zealand province, who was the Australian preaching, who was in Australia preaching missions at the time, came to Spencer to preach a three-day mission in the little church of the Holy Family in Spencer. And so, um, August, uh, sorry, Austin, at the tender age of 19, entered the Society of Mary. In a 1972 interview with fellow Marist priest, Father Tony King, Austin claimed he remembered Father's, Father Taylor's three sermons so well that he could almost repeat them word for word. So it's about 60 years later. <laughs> Soon afterwards, um, after, after this, after joining the Marist, Woodbury entered the novitiate and seminary formation in Napier in New Zealand on the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas in 1921. This would mark the beginning of a lifelong devotion to the great angelic doctor. His final thesis at the end of his seminary studies in 1926 was entitled Essay on Sacrifice, Christ's Sacrifice and the Church's Sacrifice an exposition of the theory of Father de la Taille, a Jesuit. Later that year, due to his great ac academic potential, Austin was sent to further his education at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, or the <coughs> Angelicum, in Rome for doctoral studies in sacred theology. It was there that he was taught by the renowned Dominican, Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange. His 1928 doctoral dissertation on the formal constitu constituent of the sacrifice of the mass was a further exploration of Morris de la Taille's teaching on the mass. The Eucharist seems to have been a lifelong subject of contemplation for Woodbury as evidenced by the last text he penned titled The Essence of the Sacrifice of the Mass in the 1970s, as well as numerous handwritten homilies. While studying for his doctorate in Rome, Austin was ordained to the priesthood with 145 other men on the 31st of July, 1927, by Bishop Dabrowski, in the general house of the Vincentians in the parlor. <coughs> he was the only Marist ordained on that day. He later reflected that it was the loneliest, loneliest day of his life because none of his family or friends were able to attend. His niece, Sister Moore Woodbury, 
relates that Austin fasted until the ordination mass in the afternoon, which was the custom in those days. And upon his return, he collapsed from exhaustion. During his sojourn in Rome, he attended extracurricular activities or lectures at the Jesuit Pontifical Gregorian University and the, Fran um, and the Franciscan Ponti Pontifical Seraphicum University in order to gain a detailed understanding of Suaresian and Scotus doctrines. Woodbury later commented in typical hyperbole that St. Ignatius of Loyola and his early Jesuit brothers were all Thomists. But in Woodbury's day, there was not one Jesuit Thomist remaining. You should laugh at that. <laughs> After spending a short time in, um, in Sydney in 1929, Austin was sent to teach for a year in a, at a secondary school of um, St. Patrick's College, Wellington in New Zealand. In 1930, he was appointed lecturer in the ecclesiastical sciences at Green Meadows Seminary in Napier. It was during this appointment that Woodbury providentially survived New Zealand's deadliest earthquake on record. Um, the earthquake, um, was uh, 7.4 on the Richter scale, and I think, what was it, 256 people died in that earthquake. So it was a very deadly earthquake. Some of the seminarians at the um, seminary died as well, and Dr. Woodbury related that he was in the chapel praying with some of those seminarians. When a phone call came for him, he was called out of the chapel and the roof collapsed in the chapel, killing those seminarians. Um, he incurred an injury on his hand, and from then on, um, his handwriting was always shaky. So he, he saw it as a miracle that he was saved um, from the earthquake. He returned to Sydney in 1937, being commissioned by his provincial to, to identify the location for a Mara seminary in Australia. It was upon this very site here, where we are tonight, that Woodbury founded the seminary and became the first rector. The property was large, much larger than it is today, and it enabled Woodbury and the seminarians to establish vegetable gardens and orchards to feed the growing number of seminarians, and even a cricket field to ensure the seminarians had healthy physical activity. For the financial support of the seminary, Austin put to use his expertise in breeding Illawarra shorthorn cattle in the, um, in the establishment of a stud farm in Toongabbie in 1939. It is interesting to note that Father Woodbury's expertise in Illawarra shorthorn cattle was such that he became a well-respected cattle judge at the annual Royal Easter Show in Sydney. In 1944, Woodbury made his second novitiate at the Marist House Villa Maria, Hunters Hill in Sydney. There he prepared himself for what would become the realisation of his life's dream, the formation of a house of Thomistic studies in Sydney. With fear that, sod with, that solid Catholic philosophy and theology was being lost, from Catholic seminaries, as well as a need for a systematic and integral intellectual formation of the laity, Woodbury took the initiative to found the House of Studies the following year. On Wednesday, the 7th of March, 1945, the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, Austin officially opened the Aquinas Academy. Located next to the iconic Marist Church of St. Patrick's in Gloucester Street, Church Hill, the Academy was a school of philosophy and theology open to the laity and to all interested parties. The Academy drew students from all over Sydney and from all walks of life. Students ranged from district judges to building site workers, from medical doctors to teachers. The doc, as he was affectionately called by his students, was able to teach them all. 
His vision was to have an academy in every capital city of Australia because he believed Catholic education was decapitated insofar as it lacked tertiary intellectual life. He would therefore be delighted that the grounds of the former seminary, which he founded here at Toongabbie three quarters of a century ago, now have been transformed into a Catholic tertiary um, institution. The dock was extremely busy at the Aquinas Academy, teaching at least one class each weeknight, lasting an hour and a half. With a course in philosophical psychology, Austin began his life's work of writing and teaching what one of his fellow academy teachers, Dr. Henry George Pierce, would later refer to as one of the greatest courses of philosophy ever written in the English language. The decade from 1945 to 55 saw Austin compose major philosophical courses in logic, defensive metaphysics, ontology, philosophical psychology, cosmology, natural philosophy, natural theology, and ethics, as well as many other minor treatises. Woodbury's major philosophical texts are a masterpiece of Thomistic thought and expression. Later, Woodbury would focus on writing apologetics, now known as fundamental theology, Christology, sacramental theology, grace, eschatology and commentaries on Aquinas's Summa Theologiae, as well as numerous minor works. Social, social issues also drew Woodbury's attention, for he was aware of many of the dangers threatening Western Judeo-Christian society, including socialism and spurious capitalism, which denied workers a just wage. He was also interested in various attacks on the family, including divorce, contraception, fornication, as well as on the individual, in, um, attacks on the individual, like euthanasia and abortion. He railed against dialectical materialism and moral relativism. Most of these social issues also tear at the fabric of society today. Father Woodbury was a master teacher, able to captivate students' minds and help them understand the most difficult philosophical notions. Although his texts are very scholastic, which some people may find arduous to read, his teaching style was engaging and dynamic. On one occasion, he was teaching about the state of an angel as it stood before the awesome glory of God. <laughs> Woodbury froze like this with a startling look on his face trying to imitate the angel. He remained in this posture for what seemed like an eternity to his students to the extent that some speculated that he might be having a heart attack. <laughs> but the impression was made. It was a teaching technique that he used to, to to um, foster or make the imprint in the minds of his students. Um, some key principles and sayings which Woodbury constantly referred to and which his students would certainly remember include, of all the divine things, the most divine is to cooperate with God in the salvation of souls. That's one of his key principles, and I think you can see that determining his whole life. Another one, how so much the more something approaches an influencing cause, so much the more does it participate the influence thereof. So I can, I can just hear him say, the closer you get to the fire, the more you will be consumed. <laughs> and then he would say things like, St. Thomas had a colossal intellect, a colossal intellect, <laughs> or it's a mighty principle, it's a beautiful principle, it's a beautiful principle. 
Um, he also considered Aristotle's statement that God is the understand, the understand of an understand, coming from his metaphysics book, um, book 12, to be the most perfect thing ever written by a pagan pen. And by this, um, Woodbury understood Aristotle to mean that God so far prescinds from matter that he has no potency at all. So God's act of understanding is identified with his essence. John Ziegler, a student of the doc, once remarked that by the time you completed a course in philosophy with Dr. Woodbury, even if you had grown up in the city, you would know your way around a farm because he gave so many examples from his farming experience. And I think this really sheds light on his teaching ability that he, he was able to incorporate his life experiences into the philosophy that he was teaching and to use those to convey the philosophy to, to his students. An interesting article appearing in one of the academician magazines, a short biannual newspaper published by the Aquinas Academy and circulating to more than 3,000 readers, has Dr. Woodbury providing his philosopher's 11 cricket team. The opening batsmen were, of course, St. Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle with St. Augustine as the first drop and the second drop, Plato. <coughs> Pseudo Dionysius came next, Parmenides, Boethius, Anaxagoras, Avicenna, Averroes, and then the big German, St. Albert the Great, presumably as the fast bowler of the team. <laughs> this lineup is a change from the earlier team in which he had Cajetan as number 11 and Averroes missed the cut. So one can see here the great example uh, in this, a great example of the doc's engaging teaching method. In addition to his teaching, Woodbury gained a reputation for spiritual direction with people coming from afar to pose difficult moral and spiritual dilemmas to which the doc gave prudent spiritual advice. Woodbury was no mere philosopher. Rather, he constantly encouraged his par parishioners, students and friends to seek spiritual union with God above all things, at all costs. Father's, um, Father Woodbury's writing and teaching workload was so great that in the, at the end of 1952, Two, at the age of just 53, he suffered a heart attack. Woodbury later attributed this heart attack to his stressful period in Rome, where he completed the doctorate in the quickest possible time of two years. Despite this setback, Austin resumed his teaching the following year. By the 1960s, Austin's reputation as a teacher of Thomistic and Catholic doctrine was so renowned throughout Sydney that an average of 600 students representing a wide cross-section cross of society enrolled each year in a variety of courses. Throughout this decade, Austin had up to 200 students crammed into his classroom at the commencement of each academic year. Some of his students were so faithful that they attended Austin's classes every night of the week for over 20 years. This is not only a testament of their dedication and faithfulness, but also of Austin's ability to teach, retain and captivate his audience. Austin's interests went well beyond philosophy and theology. He studied history, such as the Battle of Trafalgar, the Duke of Wellington, Napoleon, the Protestant Ref Reformation. You can see all of these different books and subjects in the, the collection itself. He also studied the sciences, physics and medicine. There are books about th those subjects there. 
He studied the arts, such as architecture, and um, particularly European ecclesiastical architecture. He loved cricket. There's about, I don't know, it seemed like 10 books on cricket in his collection. And he also um, had books on European pilgrimage sites. A quick browse of this library shows, um, shows also that one of his major loves was the natural beauty and history of the Hawkesbury River and its townships. He once declared that the Hawkesbury River is the most beautiful place on earth. It must be noted that Woodbury was also proud of his English heritage to the, to the extent that he disdained being called Augustine because it is not English. This extends even to his theological um, text where he refers to the great church father of Hippo as Saint Austin rather than <laughs> Augustine. This may also reflect his expertise in Latin. In 1962 to 65 a great event happened in church history the Second Vatican Council. Dr. Woodbury recognised the great moment of this event, the Holy Spirit working within the gathering of the bishops gathered th throughout all of the world in an ecumenical council. <coughs> Would new dogmas be defined at this council? What were the key issues to be discussed? As a fir first rate philosopher and theologian, Woodbury was logically very keen to be involved if possible. It is the practice at ecumenical councils that bishops may ask a theologian to accompany them as an advisor, also known as a paratus, to the council. Some of the notable parity at um, Vatican II were Joseph Ratzinger, Henri de Lubac, Yves Congar, Jean Danielou, uh, Marie Dominique Chenu and Karl Rana. So one can see why Woodbury hoped that he might be invited to be such an advisor in order to engage in the theological discussions with the great theologians of the 20th century. It is even reported that Woodbury had his bag packed, ready to leave as soon as the invitation arrived. Much to his disappointment, however, the invitation never came and Woodbury had to be content with hearing the news of the council from newspapers and letters. In April of 1974, Austin became ill while attending the International Dominican Congress in Rome, celebrating the seventh centenary since the death of St. Thomas. He returned to Sydney to teach his last course in theology before retiring at the end of 1974. He celebrated his golden jubilee of priesthood in 1977. And a friend of the doc, after visiting him in hospital close to his death, remarked that he was very excited, like a little child, in anticipation of a long awaited promised gift. Having suffered for a number of years from emphysema, on the 3rd of February 1979, Augustine, um, Austin finally died in St. Vincent's Catholic Hospital, Darlinghurst, Sydney. He was buried in the semina seminary grounds here at Toongabby, where he remained until the reinterment of his remains at Spencer in May 1997. So that's all I have to say about Woodbury's life. I would like to show you some pictures. Um, should we turn the lights down? <coughs> I just have um, quite a few slides. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a slide of Austin Woodbury. Maybe, I'm not quite sure, I think it might be before his ordination to the priesthood. Or, or just after, but it's a very early slide. <coughs> this is his home town of Spencer um, in 1923. It's possible, and Con, you might be able to confirm this, but one of those houses might be Austin's house. I'm not sure. Uh, no? I don't think so. Okay. Um, it's a bit hard to say, I suppose. It's probably that's, that's developed. The village. Our house, oh, well, my mother and father lived in the same house. Dad bought it from his father. 
but um, it was about a mile and a half uh, towards Gosford from from that bit of view there. Okay. It's still there. It's still there. It's still there. Okay. Okay. You can, it gives you an idea though how close Spencer is to the to the river. This uh, is a very early picture taken in New Zealand when Austin was a seminarian and so you can see him there in the middle relaxing with the others. Um, this is his diaconate ordination. Does this work? Ah, sorry, here we go. He is um, right there. And there he is dressed in his diaconate um, vestments. And this is his priestly ordination in Rome. This is the parlor of the Vincentian house in Rome. Um, he was over, over at the back here somewhere. So it's not the one with the sun shining down on the back of his head. <laughs> and so there you, you can't see him, but he's one of these ones down here lying on the floor. Um, I think uh, this was in New Zealand as well, probably after his ordination. And here he is at Boronia. The photo is dated on the back, September 1926. Both of them were dated then. I'm actually not sure where Boronia is. Con, maybe you know. Victoria. Victoria? Mm -hmm. Where's the place? Or? Don't be forward, we Oh, this would be uh, before he's ordained. Mm, I don't know. Could be his mother, maybe, in the bottom photo. I'm not sure. Anyway. And here he is with his father and his four sisters. Note that four sisters became religious sisters. Um, some of, I think he's, some of his brothers entered religious life too. One, is, one of his brothers died at, in the Battle of the Somme in World War I. And that brother apparently, uh, as far as I know, I could be wrong, um, wanted to become a Jesuit. So religi religious life was truly in the family. Um, there he is after, after he returned to Sydney, I believe, as a, um, when he was teaching. Here he is at Toon Gabby. So you hopefully should recognize this. That's the chapel behind them. Um, the curve shaped windows and so there he is as the rector of the seminary and I think my guess is that photo is taken out the front here um, I don't know any of those other people but maybe Father Luke you Father reckon Hurley, Father Hurley, Father Hurley. <laughs> was the, the Morris Parish priest at St Pat's okay yeah. It allowed him to use <coughs> the hall to start the Aquinas Academy. Oh right, okay. Okay. Father Luke, you might recognise some of the faces yeah, from years before my time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Here he is teaching. You can tell he's quite old there. This is a bit out of order, sorry. But um, he's very intense. Look on his face. Um, here he is again. Gives you an idea of how big the classroom was. Um, smoking was allowed in there as well. So <laughs> but you can see maybe, maybe you can see a bit of the showmanship going on there with Dr. Woodbury. And uh, there he is at um, his, his uh, Golden Jubilee celebrations in 1977. And then this is from the Harvest magazine, um, 1979, I think. Yeah. yeah, I guess that, yeah. Okay, so I think that's it's quite true. A teacher lives on in his students, and I think he did that especially with his students who have been able to teach many other people. Um, I'm very grateful for that. Okay, that's all I have for those slides. I'll just... Um